Oh. Okay. You're so, you got away with that. We were um, Well, <laughs> we, because we are not. Um, hoy en día, la lectura es solamente en español. Y mi, mi abuela, mi abuela me dice un pequeño consejo cuando yo era niño. Nunca olvides que todas las mujeres son locas. Nunca olvides. That's our, that's our, our, our most important thing along with Aunt Jemima today. Okay. Um, okay. My grandmother gave me a small uh, piece of advice. Never forget. All women are crazy. Todos los mujeres sin excepción, sin duda, es verdad. Lo siento, pero. Okay. Mm. All right. Today's lecture is on society, and it's a triple tripartite lecture. In fact, if you check the syllabus, you'd be like, wow. You said tripartite, and what does that mean? And then that's what it means. We're going to discuss McPherson's book first. You had a little bit of reading, which I'm sure a lot of you did not do, and some of you did. Probably a nice mixed book. Uh, then we're going to discuss about the South and then the North. Those are our three parts. It's basically um, like a day one, day two, day three rolled into one. McPherson first, then the South, then the North. All right. And uh, it will be a nice segue from one thematic uh, pin, a bowling analogy that we've knocked down. What is the next one we're gaining towards? Obviously, we talk about Drew Gilpin Faust next class, next Monday, uh, their theme of suffering. She wrote a very, very good book. And again, quotation marks. Drew Gilpin Faust, super famous historian. In fact, so famous, I might have mentioned this, but and Drew, she's a female. Uh, Drew Gilpin Faust became president of Harvard University which is like very rare. Like historians are not in the pecking order super high for anything. Like a historian might, even academically speaking, right? I just, for whatever reason, I've noticed a lot of deans and stuff to me, people like engineering, things like that, biochemistry. So not only did she write, I mean, she rose to the rank of the president of arguably the most prestigious university in the world. So, and before that, she's um, a civil war historian, a very good historian. I'm a fan of her work. That being said, it's kind of like whenever Blank puts out something, it's like, oh, it's amazing. But is it really amazing because of them? Is it actually amazing or is the reputation thing that carries it? I think about that often with jokes. Jokes are, and this is maybe, maybe I'm dispensing kind of like anti-wisdom. It's just obvious common sense points, but jokes are always dependent upon who tells them. I had this friend in college named Pat and everything that he said was hilarious everything without fail. Like he would open his mouth and we start dying laughing, like with him, like in support of him. Like he wants, he would walk around, we, he was a guy on our baseball team. And when we were upperclassmen already, he'd walk around with the freshmen and he would get in their face and he'd be like, if I ever, ever hear you say that about my sister again. <laughs> and like, we, he would do it over and over again. Everyone knew he didn't have a sister is so funny. Or one time, one time he gives this like motivational. Yeah, then he, then he slapped a guy on stage. <laughs> then he slapped a guy on stage and the people didn't know how to feel about it. <laughs> we can talk about that too is that real i don't know but this guy pat he gave the best motivational speech ever before a game and i'll share it with you briefly because brad king asked i wanted to get to the thing but he said please do this first so i aim to please um we're he he was doing this speech and the best part was again he's so funny whatever comes out of his mouth already like you're with him and it was just really great because he he pretended to be like fake cheesy coach really well. And a lot of people bought into it. It was so funny. He goes, we gather around and all these things are always awful, right? And it has been part of a team sport. It's like, come on guys today. Like we're going to like leave it on the field. It's like so stupid, right? They're, they're never good. So he comes in, he gets like really fake fired up. And he's like, I want you to look on that ridge over there. He's like, pretty soon the other team's bus is going to show up. And I want to tell you, there's three options. They're all bad. If they come in a really beat down bus, what does that say about the way they feel about us? They can show up in our field in a beat up bus. They don't have to even try. Like we're putting on this game. They come in like their worst, terrible bus. They think we're a joke. They come in a really nice bus. They think we're a bunch of like feudal serfs or something. They come in this really elite bus. They're aristocrats. We're these peasants, whatever. But I tell you the worst thing possible is if they come in the same bus we have. They think they can come to our field and be us. Like tuck our kids in the bed. <laughs> it was just so, so funny. So anyways, 
Anyways, Drew Gilpin Faust is like that. Like my friend, Pat, she is so well-renowned that really she is so well-renowned that anything she does carries this amazing hype and buzz with it. It probably won some Bancroft awards, something, whatever. Please take that with a grain of salt. If you read this book, that it's incredibly well-acclaimed judge for yourself though. Look beyond the hype of that. She's one of the most famous civil war historians of the modern era. That being said, all a disclaimer, I think the book is very, very good because it, it, it calls us readers to look at the things that are most visceral and real about war. War, God rest their souls, is about killing and suffering and dying. And she does not shy away from that. And there's a lot of really nice Catholic points in there about the art of dying, the good death, that kind of thing, last rites, chaplains. So, so hopefully you'll check out that book. If you haven't got it yet, you still have five days, I guess. And I'm sure you can actually find it. I kid you not, it's called This Republic of Suffering. I'm sure you could probably find it like Bruce Books in Pullman or some Moscow Pullman shot, the, the Bob's books on Main Street here, because it's um, it's mainstream enough. They might actually have it. Some of these books are you know obscure and it's like, well, you have to wait a month to get them online. Forget about it. This one, you might have a, a shot. Okay, so the McPherson book, guys, uh, in this reading, right, McPherson treads over ground that we covered before, which is very good. I want you to leave this class being like, I felt like we covered x and all these like 100 individual x's x points two or three times each and i really remember it he talks about clement Vallandigham. who is Vallandigham? everyone remember who that guy is talked about him uh clement Vallandigham. he was one of these copperhead northern guys right an, an enemy of lincoln escapes to canada comes back to the convention lincoln thinks about arresting him doesn't arrest him it might just inflame passions at one point, maybe the landing is going to get Canada to kind of join some secession movement with the Northwestern territories, the old, what that used to be, you know, Wisconsin, et cetera. The Landingham, to make a long story short, is simply the Northern domestic opposition to Abraham Lincoln. I love Daniel Day-Lewis. That movie was great. When he, the biopic he did of Lincoln. Has anyone, has anyone seen that? Who saw that movie? It's very, very good. What's the name? It's, it's literally just called Lincoln, right? It's just, it's called Lincoln. Yeah, he's enfleshed in that role. Like it is like Abraham Lincoln come to life. Daniel Day Lewis is a famous method actor, someone who really embodies the role they're playing. It's wonderful. However, maybe that's the theme of today's class, the Pat, my friend, there's a lot of hype before the thing. Uh, because of his amazing performance, et cetera, et cetera, maybe also while praising that, look past the propaganda. In that movie, there's often this idea of like Lincoln is just this guy is, you know, on a white night, whatever. And there's some opposition maybe from like Thaddeus Stevens and the radicals later on. But there's a lot of opposition to Lincoln. And if you subscribe to the view that Abraham Lincoln is the greatest president in U.S. history, like a lot of historians do, then that'll raise your estimation. Because it's one thing, you know, Barb is the greatest governor in Idaho history and everyone supported her. Let's praise her accomplishments, but people supported you. How much more so if you accomplish it in spite of so much backlash, Right. So Van Lanningham is one of these guys who uh, domestic opposition. Now, however, though, guys, let's talk about let's talk about economics, okay? Because one of the big critiques the Landingham makes, he goes full Bernie Sanders, and he's like, well, the one percent, the Wall Street bankers. I'm serious. I'm not trying to be funny here. I love being funny and stupid, as you know. He actually says that he's like, you know, the one percent Wall Street rich bankers are making profit off the war, war profiteering. While the common man is fighting and dying, poor man's fight, rich man's uh, war, blah, 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 all those kind of, and, and they're stereotypical claims, but they have grains of truth to them. Um, what happens with the Civil War, remember, I'm giving you an, an, another book suggestion. Please write this down and remember if, if you'd like. Stephen Mim, Stephen spelled P-H, Mim, H-I-M-I-H-M, M-I-H-M. Stephen Mim, A Nation of Counterfeiters. And what Mim argues, you can reduce his whole book, all 300 pages to, to this one phrase, really, is country and currency were forged during the war. What does that mean? Very simply that in the lead up to the Civil War, just as you have this kind of rampant sectionalism, Mississippi is its own country. We're not maybe a central government. All states' rights, every man for himself. That's the same situation you have with money and these kind of wildcat banks and counterfeit and a lack of kind of central... The Federal Reserve is obviously not founded until um, 1913, but even like a Department of Treasury, greenbacks, you know, this is this note is backed by the faith of the federal government. No, a lot of these kind of the Jacksonian bank wars, whatever. Mim argues that the Civil War, as it centralizes state power, as the Civil War decides, no, we're going to be one nation, sea to shining sea, 
All roads lead to Washington. It says the same thing for currency. Let's talk about Catholics and economics and blah, 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 blah. I'm not, Hunter, what's up, man? I am not going to ask you guys, I'm not going to ask you guys for like views on capitalism and communism and stuff. But anyone want to talk about, anyone know who Heinrich Pesch is? Anyone want to talk about Heinrich Pesch? Anyone want to talk about um, solidarism? Anyone talk about distributism? Anybody? What we're talking about to get you caught up to speed is that Stephen Mim, this guy wrote a book, historian called The Nation of Counterfeiters. He says that country and currency were both forged during the Civil War, the wildcat banks, counterfeit money, which was emblematic and complementary to the kind of rampant states' rights of the pre-Civil War era. With the triumph of federalism, the Union, strong central government, we see that with, with banks as well. I'm asking at this time, what have, have any Catholics, have you or anyone heard of these kind of third way principles that in many ways get put into what economic encyclical? We're going outside of the bounds now of the class, but that's always fun. Um, and I think it's just a good thing to kind of pause and think about because this will solidify the idea again, there's no Federal Reserve from 1913, but it will solidify that idea of like America and, and with World War One, you know, New York, the, the piggy bank of the world taking London spot and kind of central power, central money, central banks. Um, all those banking wars, again, the pre-war era, that's over. And now we're going to have centralized power everywhere, politically, economically, and transportation services. What is the great Catholic uh, um, encyclical on economics? Anyone know? The great Catholic encyclical. On economics. From one of the popes or something? Mm -hmm. It's after the war. Labor of Exorcins is John Paul II in 1981. Excellent. And that's good too. Well, uh, there's actually there's actually four. That's one of them. But we don't know what the first one is. Rerum Novarum by Leo the Thirteenth in 1891. There's four great... Please read these. By the way, I think I mentioned this before. I was going to say, I, I'll probably do a class once just on kind of papal encyclicals, but that might be kind of boring. I'm actually serious. That actually really might be kind of boring. Like every just reading papal encyclicals. I don't know who wants to do that. It's so funny. Catholics will be like that. Like, oh yeah, I totally want to do this because they acknowledge it's important. They're like, yeah, I'm not going to actually do it though. You know, it's like, tell, tell a Catholic, like read the catechism cover to cover. Like, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, if you have done that, that's good. Like, I'm, I'm serious. Like you should feel proud of that and good for you. Like people don't want to do the grunt work of our faith. Like, don't want to read, don't want to read, you know, 10 minutes of the Bible every day to read everything from Genesis through the apocalypse, St. John's apocalypse, the revelation. No one wants to do that, actually. You and Father did a, almost kind of a mini version of that with the, the um, councils. I know, that's because I'm brilliant. I'm talking about normal yeah. people. I'm talking no, about I'm normal people. I'm saying that was very interesting. I agree. I know, I agree. <laughs> you, and, you and me, we should be the philosopher kids. Someone has to play that role. Someone has to do it. So that's a job no one wants, but someone has to do it. Yeah, it's, a it's a burden. Wow. <laughs> it's a lot of it took place in the South. During the sure. But uh, yeah, like uh, the South, all over the country, though, too, especially on the frontier, like people would set up banks on the frontier the way they set up Protestant churches. Seriously. Boy, I have, and actually, this, this was the time of, of anti credentialism. The, the most rampant fraud often was medical fraud. I'm a doctor. Hey, a barb. Uh, Come over here. I'll put a leech on your back. We'll bleed you for a little bit. Trust me, I have credentials. Mm -hmm. What credentials? Are you going to question a doctor? <laughs> you know, like there is a lot of that. There's a lot of that kind of stuff. Maybe even more on the frontier. That's the Wild West. The Wild West isn't just because we're doing an OK Corral, high noon showdowns, and saloon, and blah blah. It was just like everything was fake. And like the Wild West is original social media, and like buying Russian bots to up your views and whatever. Just like it was everything was like, yeah, I am who I am. I show up in Wyoming. I'm no longer the guy with all the baggage from Philadelphia, Dave Jones. I'm actually Albert, Alfred Burt and whatever. I make up my own story. I create myself in the way. Like everything was like shadow and mirrors. And I mean, that's humanity, but Heinrich Pesch is a German philosopher uh, who really influences the second great papal encyclical on economics. There's four, I'll give you four. First one is Rerum Novarum, Leo the 13th, 1891. 40 years later, hence the Latin title, Quadragesimo Anno, uh, Pius XI in 1931. Heinrich Pesch is like Pius XI's guy. Like Heinrich, when Pius XI writes this article, he like takes all of this information, like codifies it. Then it's uh, Laborum Exorcins in 1981. And then John Paul II, most recent one, Santissimus Annus, means the hundred year anniversary of Rerum Novarum. These are all good, uh, you know, encyclicals on, on economics. All of these encyclicals reject capitalism and communism to some degree. And this is not, again, this is like we have these dumb binaries in America with, with um, 
economics. It's like, if you don't, if you criticize capitalism at all, you're a Marxist, you're a communist. You want to restart the Soviet Union again. If you are, if you're a person who's even, let's say they just define themselves as left-leaning, but you believe people should have private property, oh, you just, you want to work for Trump and do eminent domain and steal old grandma's, you know, houses in New Jersey. Like, there's no middle ground, right? It's just, you have to be, you have to be Bernie Sanders to the max plus Lenin or like, you know, the, the, the Koch brothers or whoever. Like, it's like, you can't, there's no kind of middle ground. Listen to what this guy Heinrich Pesch says are the 10 principles of Catholic social economic teaching, which takes maybe the best of both capitalism and communism, but rejects them both, whatever. And to be fair, and I'm not saying this because I'm an American, I am. I'm not saying this because I'm a proud American, sorry, guilty. But like John Paul II says, yeah, communism is worse. And of course he's colored by saying that with um, personal, experience. personal experience. Yeah, with, with, the, with the Soviets and the Nazis and all that kind of stuff. And just, yeah, Iron Curtain Poland, exactly. Thank you, it's exactly what I was looking for. So take, despite him being the vicar of Christ, take that with a grain of salt, a man he remains. I mean, okay, but yeah, I agree. Like he says at the end of the day, like even the most avaricious capitalists aren't as bad as the kind of totalitarian guy sending into the gulag. But, he's, but he still says no Catholic should be all the way like freaking, yeah, look at the tattoo I got of, my, of Adam Smith on my chest, you know, like. Um, <laughs> I've seen people, I've seen it. I got a hundred dollar bill. I got that, got it removed. Bad is a bad decision. Um, <laughs> He was actually my boss. He's your boss? <laughs> you fired him for that. Yeah, like the roles were reversed. <laughs> you got a quarter on your own? Do you have any tattoos for real? No. no. Dang it. Why? I have massive scars that have been arranged. Mm, they, they look like tattoos. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> Would you guys respect me more or less if you found out like I have like 16 tattoos just like here? Like you can't, not, you can't see them. Like, would you guys? Did that change your view of me at all? Presuming there's <laughs> respect. I guess it's like that. Imagine, ima yeah, I guess. Okay. If, it, if, if it was like a full like orthodox icon or something like that. <laughs> That'd be cool, right? Really? What if it were like butterfly orthodox? <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Please. Sophia, what do you think about Catholicism and tattoos? Any opinion on it? I mean, as much as about getting a tattoo or something vulgar. Something that's like bad than whatever. Um, it, it should be like fine but you should really think long and hard about like is this made important enough that i want it permanently on my body and like, what in your life is that important is it like a band are you trying to put this band it's like your number one thing in life is you know so you gotta like you you crush like you just walked into the room before, you, before you're even settled like it's an easy answer well done really yeah uh, <laughs> well done, really. well done. I've heard so many opinions on tattoos. Like I can't, I really have heard it all. I think like that it's absolutely evil and horrible and just never do it. it's disgusting, but like it's awesome. Like I've heard literally all the opinions. Um, Excuse me. Yeah. The, the Bible states that you shouldn't. Be but I've even, but I've even, but i even, yeah, I've even heard both on those that like, yeah, like don't make markings on your skin and stuff. Oh, that actually meant that. I don't know. I honestly don't know. I don't even know what the church honestly teaches about it. Like, I mean, definitively, dog has the church ever pronounced dogmatically on it? Like, I don't know. So, no, yeah, I so it's generally considered like discouraged, but it's not sure. And I can see that. Discouraged. Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. No one's gonna be like, hey, you know, when are you gonna? This is like a rite of passage. Let's go get you one. I don't think they're I'm, I'm encouraging at the same time. Like, I don't know. Um, I know people who have gone to the priest for quote unquote permission. Mm. Sorry. That seems like when our Lord's like, don't be hot and cold, don't be lukewarm, be hot or cold. They're trying to like have their cake and eat it too. At the same time, levying that criticism, I really respect that. I would probably do that. Like, can I please get this? Like, can you do whatever? Like, give me the absolution I can do this. Like, I'd probably be that kind of person. Like, I really want to get this, but I don't want to be in trouble. I do love God. I don't want to commit a sin, but I want this sweet tattoo. Like, what, what do I have to do? Can I do like a penance in advance or something? Yeah. I don't know. I'd probably be the same way. Oh yeah, exactly. No, that that's a brilliant point because that used to be the old stereotype, right? Only like prisoners had them or whatever, like hard hard men. Now everyone has them. Yeah, I don't, or, yeah, exactly. This one girl I know who is like in my family, like she's a girlfriend of one of my brothers-in-law. Like you know, super classy. Like the definition of 
um, kind of like elegance and all that kind of stuff, not some like hard scrabble or whatever. Like, and she has tattoos. Yeah, it's like it's become very normal, like you said, right? Rebecca was talking about how there um, about getting one. No, <laughs> was talking about how there's some they're not good for you as far as oh, health wise. Oh, just the ink in your body. I mean, I can assume yeah. like having ink in your body. Yeah. Get rid of it yeah. And you can yeah. Actually, yeah. Yeah. People who have really done that. Done. Now that's that's legit. That's awesome. I think one rule might be if you don't remember getting it, it's probably bad. <laughs> if you pray, yeah, that's that's fair enough. You wake up in the morning. Where did that come from? What a night! I want to get Aunt Jemima uh, a maple syrup bottle tattoo for you. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, economics are all, yeah, economics. I wish they were more popular because it seems like people will go into economics simply because I want to work on Wall Street or go into finance, but it's kind of like it's economics is literally like the economy of life. I think Christ says uh, you can, you can only, you know, serve God or mammon because yeah, money, if you don't have God, it, it becomes everything. It's, it's omnipresent. Why would we not want more of a kind of Catholic spin on that understanding of how to deal with the, with those and avoid those temptations. And yeah, I mean, like, so it's like, give me all your, I'll read anything. I love economics. I'm not econo an economist, but I find it, I find it fascinating. If we're talking about the, uh, the, uh, Third way or fourth way, um, economics or politics. Do you have a, Do you have any opinions on uh, Alexander Dugan? Do you want to turn off the? Uh, turn off <laughs> yeah, right. Because, so I know that. Yeah, exactly. Putin's brain. Uh -huh. uh, well, that's what it's meaned as, not. Right. right. I know. I, I'd actually. I've heard of him before. And I, was, I assume you've heard of him. No, I want to I want to read his book though because yeah. exactly like Alexander Dugan. If you don't know who this guy is, he is this philosopher in Russia. And like I said, like the media calls him Putin's brain, usually it's kind of an insult. Like, you know, he's just this. And, and they only discovered him this week. So right, so right, right. They never heard him. But he's been, yeah, he's been around now, for. But now they've heard of him. Last week they haven't heard of him. But now, now they know they, all about yeah, him. Now they've read him. Now they've read everything. Right, exactly. They knew about him before. What do, before what do you think about, what do you think about. Dugan. Yeah, what do you think of Alexander Dugan? I have no idea who that is. A week uh, later, oh, I'll tell you all about his collective works. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Typical media, yeah. But uh, he's some professor or something, and he kind of he, he's a he's a eurasianist i know that which means that he wants russia not just to restore the russian empire but that basically this is actually a really good point thank you for this this is really great this forthcoming thing uh all of american policy guys oh my gosh dude thank you this is like this is a great economic point i promise i will read you the 10 points that pesh lays out they're really great as well all american economic policy is because we're a maritime power okay that's true you can go back and read Alfred Mahan, something, the history of sea power, one of these books in the 1890s. And they say, like, we need to imitate the British. Britannia rules the seas. We have to do that. We have to have a strong Navy. That's what we do, right? We police the world supply. We're always kind of, maybe, hopefully not outright fighting the Chinese in the South China Sea and all those trade routes and whatever. If we own, we first of all, not if, we do own the world's seaways, R and our partners, R and our, that's the proper word, maybe the, the more our vassals, our serfs, whatever. But you know, the people that do our bidding and stuff, the, the Europeans and whoever. Uh, America is a maritime power that depends upon strategically keeping the Eurasian landmass bifurcated and separated. And some guy, I forget his name, I apologize to this guy. Um, if you're in heaven, you know, please pray for us. I'm sorry for not remembering your name. Um, yeah, if he's in heaven, he's a saint. Everyone has a saint, so he can pray for us. But this guy, he died a million years ago. He wrote this like in 1904. But it's still, it's not known well enough. It says, if um, if the Eurasian landmass is unified, I mean, this is what the Chinese are trying to do, the Belt Road Initiative. Everyone's heard of that, right? They have this massive superhighway, new Silk Road from Beijing into Germany. Okay, you can do that, right? You go, this is why Ukraine as well, you know, the forefront and Syria and all those issues. If you can have a unified economic system from uh, basically Mongolia and China through Kazakhstan, through Iran, the Middle East into Europe, then American sea power means zilch because they'll, they'll just have their, their own island. Dugan believes a lot of this kind of stuff. Uh, and he's like, of course, he's very anti-American. He's like, this will, you know, this will lead to the decline of the American empire if 
uh, we can unite like Russia, China, India with Europe and just do our own thing. Then, then that will become the new center of the world, not the American maritime empire. It's really, really interesting stuff. This is why America is so involved in the Middle East. It's not just because of oil. It's to like, we, we need Israel to hate Iran, Iran to hate Israel, et cetera. We need those antagonisms. If they're all unified and they all decide to join like the Chinese specter, we're screwed economically. Like we'll, we'll, we'll have to, I mean, that's too strong of a word. We just won't be top dog anymore. We won't be able to say like, we can sanction whoever use the maritime routes. They'll have the, the center thing. And Dugan has said his controversial stuff, or no, it's a different guy, I think. I don't want to, you know, falsely attribute, but I think he has a similar views. Like, we need Russian soldiers to wash their boots in the Indian Ocean. Like, a lot of these yeah, guys have this huge, Indian. no, it's okay. somewhat, it's, uh, he would say that, I think, like that. He's very much like super expand. He wants Russia to become America, just a world expansionist power, et cetera. Uh, Russian soft power instead of American. You can see why the American media hates him and vice versa. But, uh, some other guy, I forget, some guy, super nationalist guy made that quote, but it's like, yeah, a lot of it depends, a lot of the economic chain, if if the Eurasian landmass is united, we can't rule the world anymore. Yeah. But now, Russia, Putin has told America that if you want any more energy from us, and even Europe, you have to pay us in Russian money. That's great. Gold, yeah. Or I property. Uh huh. Well, I just I just saw that today. He confirmed. Uh, uh, thank you for that's a great current event. Um, I just saw the res that they changed that or they rescinded it somehow. Olaf Scholz. Olaf Scholz is the German Chancellor guy since Merkel stepped away, and he confirmed that Putin actually will allow Germans to keep importing Russian gas, paying by euro. So they kind of here, if you don't know, Germany imports eighty percent of its gas from from Russia. Let's go with the narrative. I'm not here to judge. But let's say, yeah, Putin is evil. Putin is terrible. We should do everything to resist him. All that is true what the media is saying. He's, he's the new Adolf Hitler. Okay. Even if that's true, Germany sanctioning him, if you believe that's the moral thing to do, is a suicidal act. All of their supply comes from Russia. They're done. You can't have run windmills in you know 10 degrees in the winter, right? Solar energy and wind power. You can't. You need the fossil fuels. So Russia has that trump card that it totally controls European energy. But a lot of this kind of, now I should probably pause the video, get off into Klaus Schwab and Great Reset and all this kind of stuff and conspiracy theories. But, um, go ahead. Russia's got a, a kind of a corner on some of the market for uranium too. Russia is incredibly rich with all resources, mm -hmm. unbelievably rich. And in fact, the, the breadbasket of Europe, which always has been Ukraine, is that Eastern section, especially. A lot of, I read a very interesting article in the New York Times that said, which was interesting, right? The New York Times, just so much about like the mainstream or if you want to go full insult, like propaganda, whatever. This guy, Brett Stevens, a columnist was like, what if Putin hasn't miscalculated? What if that's wrong? What if we're miscalculating saying, oh, look, he was going to take over all of Ukraine in 10 days and he failed and look, they're retreating. And this guy, Brett Stevens, like, what if he, all he wanted to do was just create chaos and whatever and take the Eastern parts. A lot of the Eastern cities have fallen like Maripol and Kharkiv and whatever. And that's the energy rich resources anyways. When Crimea seceded in 2014, if you draw like a kind of little like half moon into the Eastern part, that's all the energy rich resources. If he takes that, he has all the resources. Then the West becomes just this kind of like albatross for Europe, taking all these refugees, financial support becomes like a welfare state. What if that was, the, I mean, again, I shouldn't comment on this. I'm very biased towards America, being an American, right? Uh, and so like, I, I always want to believe the American view, but it's like, there's just a lot to consider. Um, yeah. Okay. What about Heinrich Pesch? He is the, the mind. He's the Dugan for okay. Leo. The, the... I'd like to say one more thing. Yeah, sure. Also, Putin has invited the people from South Africa, the Caucasians, to come and live in Russia, the farmers, and mm -hmm. he would give them land. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting. That's an interesting subset of global migration too, of the world being as small as now. You can do these kind of mass things with airplane flights and whatever, right? It's not like, hey, walk across the entire African continent or whatever, etc. In, in all directions, whatever the purpose of the immigration or whatever, wherever the people are coming from, you can kind of engineer these things pretty quickly. My family history chapter in the great. That's exactly my, my German. I'm not even. I'm not even. Okay. I'm, I'm not even kidding. Like, are you part of the German people that were in Russia? Yeah, you are. Yeah. So was Father Father Tom's ancestry. That's what I heard. I missed that. He didn't repeat it that evening. What if Father Tom at the end of one of his like homilies should be? By the way, the Anastasia, the last Romanov, 
didn't die. She's my grandma. I'm just walking up the stage. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. just not comment further. Whatever. He'd just be like, just drop the thing and just not comment. And say, when people ask him about it, be like, I'm sorry, it's too painful to bring this up. I don't want to talk. In respect for my grandmother. Like, not to talk about it at all. <laughs> they could be talking about my family. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. they were <laughs> just say that. Yeah. Heinrich Pesch, Brad King, I agree with you. He's thinking I can read minds. He's thinking right now, when are we gonna get when the F are we gonna get to this Heinrich Pesch guy? Yeah, right now. You're right. You're exactly right. Heinrich Pesch, Catholic economics, third way, not capitalism or communism. This has been a freaking epic stream. I, I do say this to myself. It's nice to comment mainstream, like we're crushing. Thanks to Sophia Spesh. She started the ball rolling down the hill in a good way. Her and Hunter come in, like shot in the arm. The competition was already good. Aunt Jemima was already on the board. Everyone's winning today. <laughs> Wait, why were we talking about anchovy? We because we got a lot of syrup today. A lot of maple syrup to get through. And this is Russian, Russian. 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 I do. I love anchovy and maple syrup, and especially anchovy and maple syrup. Changing it to Pearl Milling Company broke my heart. Oh, that's what they're thinking. Um, they already did. So Heinrich Pesch rejects both collectivism and individualism. The Catholic position, he says, and if you're like, oh, who cares? Who's this stupid German guy? Uh, well, again, Leo the the, um, excuse not Leo, Pius XI mm -hmm. in 1931, Quadragesimo Anno, which I will humbly declare, I think is the best of the four. And I like it the most. Even though Rare Novarum is the most important, it's one that set, like, opens the field of this Catholic third way economics. If you're like, what well, I'm about to read something, you're like, who cares this guy thinks? Well, then say that to Leo, to Pope Pius XI. I mean, like, it's, it's, it has a stamp of approval from pretty high authority, right? When, when Pius XI basically says, right, Everything that Sophia wrote about this, I'm just going to use her work as my like my like mess sheet, my rough draft for my official encyclical. It's a pretty high compliment to this guy Pesh. Rejects both collectivism and individualism for all these things. Catholics should dot dot dot. He's saying reject the collectivism of kind of uber communism and just the unalloyed individualism. I don't care if you're starving to death. I can have nine yachts. I can buy a tent. That doesn't matter. Like reject both those things. So he's against both Adam Smith and uh, Marx. The first principle of Catholic economics, Heinrich Pesch says, is moral value in the common good. That's number one. Number two, a solidarity amongst men because of a common humanity. This is not one world order agenda 21, 50, whatever, UN stuff. This is like all men, right? Christ died that all may live for God so loved the world. We're all men made in the image likeness of God, that kind of common humanity, not fake modern atheistic and NATO humanity, whatever. Like this is like, rooted in scripture, of course, obviously. A solidarity amongst men because we all have a common humanity. Whatsoever you did to the least of my brothers, you did unto me, right? That Matthew 25 judgment was hungry, gave me to drink, thirsty, you gave me, thirsty, gave me to drink, hungry, gave me to eat, naked, you clothed me, right? Those, 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 all that, the sheep and the goats. Number three, worker cannot be reduced to a means of production. No, right? No, Marx, you can't plug in people into some cog in the wheel system, whatever. Number four, the free market advantage is good, but he's against complete free trade, okay? So he's like, a lot of these are like, oh, like it seems he ticks off everyone and everyone likes something about it. Yes, the free market. Oh, Father Sirico, who's here for the debate, he would be singing right now, right? He's all free market. He even yeah. said, he's like, I don't even want to call what I defend capitalism. I want to call it free market economics. Pope is saying the free market is good, not unlimited free market stuff. Why is Haiti and Africa in such poverty? Because we decide, yeah, we can undercut their farmers and ship in our garbage and whatever and dump our stuff and it kills the local economy. The best, some economists have said the best thing we could do to make Haiti flourish would be to sanction them because it would, it would encourage domestic production. Africans say the biggest blight on their economy are free clothes from the West because that they, 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 they all their cotton farmers, their cotton, all their stuff, they don't do anything. So there's just mass employment, right? So they say no free market, some protective protection is good. Some tariffs are good. Five, self-interest is good. That seems pretty capitalist, but it must be reined in. Balanced self-interest. Yes, if there's no self-interest, if the communist dystopia of like the doctor makes as much as the garbage man, I'm just not, not going to become a doctor. I'm not going to spend 10 years in medical school to make what the garbage man, I'll just become a garbage man. And you might argue like truly, I'm not saying this to be nice, the garbage man is a very noble, essential profession. If we didn't have a garbage man, our cities would be horrible, right? But no one's going to argue that it takes the same amount of training or whatever. And so if self-interest is good, yes, seek to make more, keep more for yourself, but it must be reined in. Basically, that is what distributism, distributism argues that, that private property is good, capitalism, and it should be distributed as widely and as, and as 
uh, cozily as possible. That's horrible. Because what distributism says is, in both capitalism and communism, people are enslaved. In capitalism, you're enslaved to the whims of the big corporations and the avarice of rich people and regulations and Wall Street bankers. In communism, you're enslaved to the state. In capitalism, you have a couple slave masters called oligarchs. In communism, you have one slave master, the state. In distributism, everyone is like the American dream of the capitalist private property, keep what you own, what, et cetera. But in light of the common good, you don't get to just buy, do whatever you want, buy a million yachts, boats, hotels, make as much money and F everyone else. Like, you know, oh, well, I just, I, I can. I can take Dave Schmidt's house because I can, whatever, I'm BlackRock, I can buy them out. Like you can't, if you care about morality, you can't do stuff like that. It should, you should want everyone to own their own stuff, have their, keep their own money, pay less taxes, less government, all the things people on the right like, but within the value of the common good. Sounds like a suburban dream. Sounds pretty good. Sounds like lemonade and 2.3 kids. Yeah, exactly. Uh, promotion. Come on. Sounds like lemonade and 61 kids. <laughs> promotion of voluntary groups of association. 69, the world record for one woman. Is it really? Yeah, in Russia. Wow. <laughs> of course she's Russian. <laughs> while, while wrestling a bear or something like that. Yeah. That's crazy. And the, and the guy had a, like, I think previously, the guy had another one. So we have like something like 70 something or 80 something. So. Wow. <laughs> I, yeah, I need to fact check this. Yeah, I need true. to I need yeah. see what Snope says in the New York Times is about that. 69 kids, crazy. Yeah. 70 kids. Yeah, well, guess what? It wasn't 100. It was, wasn't, it wasn't triple digits. No. That's what Trisha's thinking. She's like, so what? <laughs> <laughs> promotion, promotion of voluntary groups of association, not state imposed. Okay. So he's saying here pro union. People should be able to voluntarily get together. You can't do what Reagan did and fire all the air traffic controllers. You're allowed to have things. They shouldn't go full communist. They shouldn't be like the Chicago Teachers Union that never that doesn't want to teach ever, right? We're never going back to work. Right. Neither, neither, neither left or right, just Catholic. Seven, no illusions of a panacea acknowledged fallen man we're not going to have marx's you know freaking earth utopia nor will if we just cut regulations everyone will be happy to no both both no eight kind of recap private property always yes private property can never ever be abridged private property can never be done away with but it must be in line with the common good ideal please show some restraint temperance is a cardinal virtue if you own a, a beautiful property in your house and maybe you also are lucky enough, praise God, out of a cabin in the woods, you're, you're done. Please, you don't need to buy 13 other properties, especially especially if you're doing it like in a competitive way to put someone else out of business. Fine. If you're a, an owner of like a thousand properties and they were just kind of laying there and you got them and you're, you're helping society, you, that's great. But you shouldn't be like, oh, I have whatever. That's not good enough. I want to bankrupt Dave Schmidt because I can't, because it's the jungle. That Avoid that kind of stuff. So, so number nine, socialization and the universal destination of created goods. That's interesting. Universal destination of created Everything we make in, in the economy has this universal common brotherhood character. And so it's like, again, there's this idea of restraint and this idea of like kind of fair use and justice. And um, which again, Chesterton, I, this is the greatest point of all time. Chesterton said, all of the modern world is simply vices, the virtues gone to the extreme and they're ruined. You should have a common brotherhood and some crazy woke people be like, that means you never, ever can say anything about anyone, right? And we have to do speech codes or it's like, you should be tolerant of people. Well, that means you never should criticize anything, right? It's just a good intention, paving the road to hell, taking it out of control. Common destination of goods doesn't mean, okay, well, then no one gets to own anything. Uh, World Economic Forum, you'll own nothing and be happy. No, right? Private property can never be a bridge. You want to own stuff. It means don't go psycho. It means you don't have to have your fourth Cessna plane or whatever. Like you just, like and morally speaking, maybe it's not illegal at all and you can afford it. That's not the point. You're missing the point of life, right? You're, you're like almost tempting scriptural wisdom of it's harder for a rich man to pass the, whatever, the camel through the eye of a needle than a rich man to go to heaven. Like just it's bad for your soul. You might, you might be able to totally legal, get away with it. Why well, just don't live that way? And number 10, above all, just wage and pricing. Nothing is so good for the economy as paying people a fair wage. And that makes sense. If you pay your workers well, what are you going to get? You're going to get, what would happen, do you think? Public school sucks. Everyone agree? Public school is doing pretty bad. What would you do if, if and, I'm not, and I'm not saying you should do this because this would be like uber state control. But imagine if the state said every 
public school teacher, their starting salary is mandated to be 100 grand a year. Imagine the quality of teachers you start getting. Every state, every public school teacher has to make a million dollars a year. You get the best of the best. You would be like fighting each other to like go to Harvard. Like you get the most, we'd have the number one public education system within 10 years, right? Because you'd be like, I want to make that money. I'm not going to go deal with public school now and make $26,000 or whatever a year. But if I'm getting paid $300,000, okay. And then, you know, I'm going to, and then if it's just valuable, maybe there'll be more also like tell these kids to get that out of my classroom. I'm not going to be like, oh, well, you know, uh, you know, the student's always right. It would maybe improve everything. So here's where like money and like capitalistic like price value is put to good use. If you pay people a just wage, though, yeah, that's kind of obvious, that's right? Not what you're, I mean, I just to argue a little bit, but a just wage is not three hundred thousand a year. I'm not thousand. saying that exactly. Yeah, yeah, that that would be an unjust. That'd be that. Oh, you're a thousand percent right. Yes, a just what a just wage used to mean was for, and again, I, I've confessed so many times, like I'm kind of a feminist, and that's kind of gross, like. It sounds so pandering, but what I mean is like for my personal life, like my, my wife got her PhD a year before I did. She works, both of us work full-time. We like it a lot. Both of us were very blessed, thank God, to be professors where we can both work and raise our kids together. So I'm no like traditional, like the man should work and the woman stays at home and raise, that, that's fine. But that's not my story. So I'd be a hypocrite to say that. That was the argument that the old just wage was that it should be for one, for the father to work and the mother to be able to stay home and raise kids and not have to work, right? A lot of advocates for kind of the, the traditional family structure where the man works, the mom stays at home with the three, four, five, six kids and homeschools them. A lot of people who are very upset that, oh, with the you know inflation and deflation and credit cards and whatever, and the devaluation of dollar in the seventies, that was like a ploy to get women out of the house and like corrupt the youth. And then kids with latchkey kids and all that kind of stuff. So just wage used to be enough for a father just to work, a mother to be home if she wanted or work if she did not have to work. Like, I, thank God, my wife and I both, we love to work, we love our jobs. But a just wage would mean that like we live in a society where one parent can choose not to work and it's not a problem. They can, they'll have less. Maybe they can't go to vacation blank. They have to go to vacation local or there's some tightening in the belt, right? And shop at Costco bulk instead of getting fancy food, but they can pay their bills. That was a just wage. So yeah, it does not mean I'm being absurd. Yeah, a quarter million dollars a year. But, but it, it, yeah, just wage does not mean that that's an example of the full woke mm -hmm. virtue out of control. Like everyone should earn $10 million a year. Yeah, like well, print free money. It, it changes from between where you live. If you live in California, you need a higher wage than if you live in Idaho. Absolutely. So, yeah, no, exactly. That's why like the idea of like a national $15 minimum wage is great news for Idahoans and bad for Californians, right? It's like, that's not the same. It doesn't go, the $15 aren't different in California. Right. Everything has to be kind of adjusted pound for pound. I mean, that kind of is already. And I'm not going to comment. Maybe the minimum wage as it is now is disgusting and like complete violation of workers' rights. I don't know enough about to say it. I, I just know that you're right. Like, it's not exactly. No one would argue. Yeah. Uh, making 80,000 in New York City is like making 80,000 on the blues. That's ridiculous. No one would say that. There's, I think, also, this to include, you know, the effort it took to get to their position. Takes them to a yacht shop, right? I mean, that's what you're saying. Yeah, not to say that workers are fungible, but uh, most people, with myself being excluded, can work at Arby's. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's fire from Arby's. <laughs> so, it's an epic, it's an epic story. So, so walking the dishes too slow. Mm. We're 50, so 15. You should have told them quality's not appreciated anymore. But I'm just, I'm just saying, like, a just wage, if, if you have been paid, so if, if you're not talking a socialist system where your education is paid and where healthcare is paid, okay, if you've decided to drop out of school at some point and you're going to work at McDonald's, well, I'm sorry, most people could do that. And so why should that person get paid as much as the garbage collector who actually has <laughs> yeah, but what I'd ask, what I'd ask, that's a great point. What I'd ask is why does McDonald's exist anyways? You know, and like, I'm really like in a healthy society, like I am not some health nut person. I will say when I, this is going to be really surprising, right? Brave, this can going to be shocking news. When I eat bad, I feel bad. When I eat good, I feel good. I know this is like a revelation, but I mean, I'm serious, right? Like, why do we even like, why do we allow, this is stupid. I'm not, I sound like some kind of like wannabe kind of communist, you know, 
Politburo guy. Like, how, why does society allow these to exist? Shut them down. Like, they exist because they're a business and whatever. I've, I really, really love Chick fil A a lot. It's amazing. It's a free market. Yeah. I, I'm not some kind of elitist. Like, I've never had fast food in my life. Um, Chick fil A is the, I, I like literally, I, I try to have Chick fil A once a year because it's so freaking good. It's so tasty. I get it. What I'm saying though, it's terrible for you. All of it's terrible for you. What, if you, if you thought in kind of like a Aristotelian almost kind of society of common good that Catholics have always been drawn to, maybe people could do something else and be more valuable. And I don't, I don't know. I, I am not an economist. I don't know where the plus and minus would go. I wonder if all fast food was abolished and those people had to go into making like organic bakeries or something. And out of all that money somehow was able to fund it. And we agree to society, I will pay more for like your homemade hand rolled breakfast burrito. And then you make more if everyone would not be better off. I, I don't know. I'm just saying that it's like, yeah. so it's like that McDonald's just sounds depressing all the way around. Unless it beats in the end. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, it, it, that, that's you. Love your curves, accept your- there's an argument that it's not a black market for McDonald's. Hey, hey, come here. Let's meet this uh, dark alley. Two hundred bucks for double whopper. Three hundred. There's an argument that uh, uh, that promotes peace. Have you heard about that? No. Uh, well, it's about how capitalism promotes peace, but it's McDonald's is, is used as a proxy war. So no two countries that have both had McDonald's oh, got have ever gone to war. With the exception of right, Russia and Ukraine, and then McDonald's shut down our yeah, right, right. I've actually been nationalized. So, no, no, that I, it's no longer even an exception. I love uh, what I was going to say was when I, I thank you for reminding me almost kind of without without doing that, just triggers in my mind. Um, the next class that I'm gonna do next year, I think I mentioned this to you all, is on America. I can't wait, like, it's gonna be the craziest class I've done to date. It's gonna be like one hippo lecture of a class. It's just like everything, like it's gonna be like film and art. And it, it's obviously I am, I am as a tiger cannot change his stripes. I am a historian, like it will be history based. Every class and we'll follow a nice chronology because it's only fair. I'm not gonna go so abstract that we're gonna start in 1971. <laughs> and then the next day, 1780. It's like, we're not gonna do that. But in that class, I'll be very excited when we get to the 1990s. I was, I was born in 1987, and so and I did not really live through the 90s with any consciousness of what was going on. Like, one of my earliest memories in the 90s, the most vivid, is like the Y2K party to celebrate 2000 when I was 12 years old. Of course, I have tons of memories before, and what I mean is like you have no, at that age, obviously, an understanding. The 90s were this crazy, like, unipolar world where a person like Francis Fukuyama mentioned before said the history is over, the whole world's going to accept liberal democratic capitalism, McDonald's, Friends, Seinfeld, everything. And all of those things are going to, that, that soft power, soft power, not the hard power of war, soft power, American soft power will conquer the world. So I've heard that argument, of course, that America putting up McDonald's all over the world is a kind of colonization that's consensual, whether people maybe would say they like it, but they're just then agreeing to like be part of the American system and they're being kind of grand, like scooped in. Okay. I I'm simply talking about like, again, <laughs> I'm not going to in like five minutes be like, so by the way, you guys go to Vandal Catholic. I have this diet book I wrote, subscribe or whatever. Like I'm not a freaking dietitian. I'm not going to sell you some program. I have no idea. I just know common sense. Yeah. When I eat well, I feel really good. When I don't, I feel bad. I actually struggle with that so much as a Catholic, like Sunday is the off day. Right. And so like, I have, I absolutely, I'm not even kidding. I have an addiction to ice cream, thousand percent. I have gone at times like six months without eating ice cream. We give, I give out for Lent every year. Every Easter, I'll eat like nine ice creams. Like just boom, 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 boom. boom. It's like freaking, it's like setting up like straight down. But it's scary. It's like, yeah. Well, it's like the saturated fat is like you're really worried. Yeah. I think, I mean, I love McDonald's and I obviously way too much of it, but I think that everything, if you're going to say everything in moderation, then even McDonald's in moderation. Fine. I, I do not disagree with that. I, I agree with you. Yeah. Moderation would be the key. Sure, sure. You like to go to McDonald's. For this, to celebrate Sunday, the, the rest mm -hmm. day, the feast day, and you have you like to have a, a burger and fries. That's great. I think I'm saying the God bless the people that have like a, a struggle with that every day and twice a day or something like that. But I'm just saying in general that like I don't think like I like the Moscow co-op despite them being like woker than woke. Um, that's the only place I ever got yelled at for not having a mask on. <laughs> Some guy was following me around, oh, no. and yeah, it was it was a good experience actually. 
Actually, it was terrible. I was trying to look up some redeeming. It was really bad. No, it's yeah. less about those who are persecuted. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. There you go. No, but it, it was funny. The guy just was like, you know, and God bless him. I mean, like, I, I never want to make fun of COVID. I had COVID. It sucked. And it was like, I definitely, I take it seriously. But the co-op is so freaking woke. It's good. They have good stuff. It's very expensive. It's, I love going there for their beer and stuff. It's fun. I wish we had more options like that. Then, and then you could just have, like you said, like McDonald's is a treat once in a while. If you like, I my McDonald's is Dairy Queen. I love blizzards from Dairy Queen. Actually, I lied to you guys. I'm sorry. I told you last year we we're going to have the classic Hoover Country, and we never did that, right? We still have to. Oh, right. I promised that we never, I never followed through. Maybe this year because maybe in May, maybe I really May will already be the Easter season. I'll, I'll, I'm not going to go if I can't eat ice cream. I'm just going to be honest. Like I'm not going to be there. I have to. This, this has to be about me. Cougar Cougar Country uh, in Pullman has these things called. Uh, cyclones and they are so good they're the knockoff version of uh like the polex the rolex they're the the, the knockoff of the blizzard and they're so freaking good <laughs> Go ahead. yeah please may, may you bring us back kind of on topic this has been this has been one of our best I, classes ever i really I think want to go back to, but um i want to go back everything moderation i agree and just wage is bad. A little bit of McDonald's, a little bit of Alexander. Well, what I want to throw in there is there, there's a lot of pressure on employers, businesses, etc., to make a just wage for the landscape. I mean, that's fine. Um, but I think there's also a need for just expectations, if you will. And we have so many people that are making a fine wage to support their family, but they both work nonetheless. You know, and that's, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that, for self-fulfillment, et cetera. Well, like but I said, for me, when I'm... we look purely economy, what is it that we, as families, as individuals, what do we need? Yeah. You know, I mean, we're, we want it all. I want two cars and, a boat, <laughs> and a, you know. So I think that's a huge part of the thing. It's not just uh, the economic controllers if you will totally yeah there's no controllers that's also the point like we we enslave ourselves are, to whatever to our passions and, like the yeah. money the money that's that rich people have in capitalism is only because other people pay them for you, right they're not well like, that's a free money absolutely they want to just play more now but the problem with the entire yeah. argument yeah but there was then their parents that were paid for some profits that they created right mm -hmm. but the problem with the entire and the parents argument. have a right to pass their wealth on to their children <laughs> I'm going to say it 15 times, you know, because this is going to get really hot. <laughs> the problem of the entire argument is that reasonable people can disagree with what just is. Mm -hmm. So if you can't have sort yeah. of a, a blanket definition, which is a problem in a lot of areas of life, then you're going to have disagreement. Like, I think a just wage is that Dave needs two cars, he gets work, he gets into two cars. The reason you don't have more than one Moscow co-op is because you don't have enough people who would frequent more than one Moscow co-op. I try to get fresh mm -hmm. fish here. It's nearly impossible because you can't get people to sell fresh fish here, right? You get them the truck guys, but by that time it's three days old. No one's going to fly fish in here because you don't have enough of a market. Yeah, that's true. So, so it does all kind of function together economically. And again, is that fair? I don't know what No, yeah, that's fair. right. You know, you're right. But again, we disagree about what just is. If people really want to fish from in here, you like, you know, set up a We can make it known, yeah. Yeah. There's, yeah, sure. No, right. There's, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I also don't want to do like, oh, the grass is greener on the other side. It often is not. Right, the solution. Oh, this will fix everything. It's worse, way worse. Just take me back to whatever that was that American capital McDonald's that I lie was fine. Life was good then, right? After we tried our experiment to do whatever, like yeah, exactly. Like the the ability of human beings to screw stuff screw stuff up is, is like limitless, right? Yeah. And so it's like, yeah. and, and, and capitalism is actually super democratic in that it allows everyone to vote within run, rather than like if you have any ideologically based system, it's one you know academic person like you or me deciding like sure. what is the what is the best thing for everything? Right? You're absolutely like right. Central planner You're absolutely right. Yeah. The, you know, the mining and the farming and the technology and all that. That shouldn't be. That That's right. Be. Well, if you know, part, of the, part of the another of a thousand parts of the issue, 
uh, is the government's role in terms of, like, for example, farming you mentioned. Um, what I've recently read, 46% of farming is subsidized. Or 46% mm -hmm. of the dollar yeah. farmer gets yeah. Yeah. is coming out of our taxes. Yeah. And you wonder about some of those things, you know, those decisions. You know, when you talk about just economy, et cetera, yeah. Um, yeah, the of government is sort of shooting that in the Sometimes the government inserts well intentioned, but they insert themselves. Yeah. And then they just kind of and now with artificially the, affected. And they did that in civil war. In China, though, which is kind of be a little. Yeah. Trying to bring us sure. back to the sure. um, <laughs> Oh, that's all I think about. We're in this class. <laughs> and capitalism. Yeah. If, yeah. If, if you if you treat everybody differently, you get where in, in other words, if everybody get the same thing, everybody be equal. You have to treat everybody differently. That's kind of the socialism thing. If you get everybody equal in an outcome, but if you like the capitalist system, if you treat everybody the same, then what happens is everybody does come out differently, which is exactly what you want because you've got people who will excel because it's worth doing. I couldn't agree. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I would one hundred out of a hundred percent always choose to live in. What we have now or any kind of capitalist system versus like anything in the ussr a thousand percent i think anyone who denies that is just completely foolish and disconnected from reality um go ahead i just had another thought that i was trying to fit, fit in somewhere but one thing thinking of the other you know everyone can be different but thinking of the others or other people around you is an important you know catholic mm -hmm. thing and like in India, when we're in India, they have this expectation where if you make money, you still need to employ those who are less fortunate. That's just part of life. Like this, this family, he was a surgeon and they lived in a very small, modest home, but they had a chauffeur, which he could drive, they didn't need. They had a housekeeper who would come in and do the dishes small home they didn't need it but this kind of this uh, expectation epic status those that were less fortunate i just thought that was really a nice you know very catholic it's sure creating creating jobs yeah. yeah no yeah right 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 for sure for sure for sure but in india only certain people take the jobs as the chauffeur and the house cleaner and only certain classes of people hire them right like you have a caste system. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. oh yeah. Right? It's so not, isn't it? Try and, yeah, that's try, true. Yeah. try and get a housekeeper mm -hmm. or a chauffeur for the amount of money that they pay in India. Yeah. In in relative terms, right? Yeah. In American dollars, it, it wouldn't happen. Right? Yeah, well, yeah, that's true. true. Absolutely. You know, they have people who are willing to work. Well, take a look at that's this. True. Yeah. Yeah, what you've got going right on right now in Northwest, probably all over the country. A lot of people are going to the these vocational schools mm -hmm. and stuff like that, and those schools are mm -hmm. doing pretty well, doing very well as yeah. opposed to just going in and getting a full mm -hmm. Yeah, and he's he's now a Toyota Master Tech kind of a guy. He's making he busts his butt to be sure, but he's making really good money. Mm -hmm. Good for him. That's awesome. It's good that decision paid off. Yeah. His route was to go to the job That's great. That's great to hear. Some of that is um, connected directly to again the government, what they're how they're aiding and assisting community problems. Now, yeah. I've, I've met some people that work at McDonald's and they have a BS or a BA. Yeah. I am every day more and more just aware of like the absolute like complexity of life and like yeah. when people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In all different walks of life, people that identify as like leftists have these like really right wing views and vice versa. And it's impossible to like put people in a box. Like, yeah. yeah. I'm going to give you the Civil War stuff in five minutes right now. <laughs> but no, this, this, I'm not, I'm not kidding. Like, this actually has been one of our absolute best classes because when you really think about it, I'm serious. 
originally Father Chase, who I never will stop singing the praises of, like this was all his vision when, when I first started here in 2019. And at first we thought like the classes I would offer because I do the hippo lectures as well, like the debate that, that actually materialized later on, but like that it would almost be like kind of four or five weeks. And I was like, no, I want to do the, I want to do the whole semester for a course. I want to do like a upper level undergrad graduate level course. The best part of when you guys come here, it's like, yeah, I can just like go and like do straight lectures as was really kind of the pro forma last semester with World War One. So much information to get through, I would just like lecture straight on, right? This is awesome when we kind of just have these open discussions because that's the whole point of like the intellect department of like, we're, there's so many great things being said today. So much good food for thoughts. I really thank you for that. And that's, act that's actually on topic. On direct topic of the class, like I said, again, I mentioned this a million times, a million and one, we covered the chronology very well in all February. Before we get to reconstruction or after that, I will have a full synapse with the action on the board. I'll have it in like a PDF format so I can email it to all of you who want it. The whole class, like for the final time, like we are transitioning. Anyone who came in, Hunter, Sophia, Marie, people that came in a little bit later, what I said earlier was we're transitioning now, if you follow the syllabus, from having taken down our first theme, which was religion. Actually, our, we have taken down two themes. We started with Emory Thomas and nationalism, right? That book, the Confederate Nation and the Gnap book. We just finished Ray Bull, uh, God's Almost Chosen Peoples. Next, we're going to Drew Gilpin Faust, this Republic of Suffering next week. This lecture today, we're right on schedule, society. I like that it's been kind of this open discussion. The, the connective thread of everything we talked about was that the Civil War, Stephen Mim, remember, currency and country, just as a unified national, all roads lead to Washington, political system was forged out of the Civil War, so too with economics, no more kind of wildcat counterfeiting banks. And really the first seeds of kind of the Federal Reserve, US conglomerate, a, a lot of the things that come to the fore in, in the World War I, 20th century period kind of begin in the American Civil War, begin with the American, especially the sea to shining sea, transcontinental railroad four years later, all that stuff. South is defeated, now do the whole contiguous US. And once we have that, then we can step out into the world stage with Theodore Roosevelt as a world power. There's a lot of that there. Money was the first thing in Heinrich Pesch, Quadragesimal Anno, all those principles, I think we found them useful. Two was Southern society. In Southern society, kind of three things are happening, three points. One, changing conceptions of womanhood. Elizabeth Fox Genovese, um, what's her name? Victoria Bynum, Sarah Rubin, Mm, another person too, Elizabeth McCurry, I think, Stephanie McCurry, excuse me. These authors write a lot about kind of like womanhood in the South. They basically say Southern women are the most Southern belle. That's why the stereotype, like they did literally nothing often, right? Kind of just, they're the, the mistresses of the place. A lot of them kind of like Rosie Riveter in the Second World War are forced into roles with the men gone. And if you add, this is, this is the great point. This is the only point I want you to understand. If you're interested in kind of the history of feminism in America, if you're like, why the, the, the Seneca Falls Conference is the thing, right? 1848, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, these women get together in New York. Why is that only a Northern phenomenon? Well, these Southern women historians say that's because the women in the North, not only were they in this progressive puritanical culture that maybe had gone, gone away from the pilgrims' religious faith, Calvinism, into kind of like social change, right? The first so social justice warriors. And I, not saying that tongue in cheek at all, literally like with anti-slavery, temperance, women's suffrage. We're gonna change, we're gonna take the religious zeal we used to have for Calvinistic uh, heaven on earth and make it into social movements. They have that, also they live in cities close to one another. Southern women are, are more conservative by nature perhaps, but they also lived in rural communities far apart from one another. The war changes that. It like develops the first time women are like, I'm involved now, I'm like running the plantation, whatever the men are gone. And remember, if I can jog your memory back, what's the ultimate domestic event that happens in the Civil War in the South? Remember? What, what happens in the home front where like women are really involved, like it's kind of a- No food. Yeah, the bread riots. Remember in order from Atlanta, mm -hmm. Salisbury, North Carolina, Mobile, Peterson, Richmond, April 2nd of 63, Jefferson Davis throwing his wallet, take it, you crazy women. You know, they have the guns and they're gun coming to get the stuff. They're politically mobilizing. A lot of women say that Southern kind of political female agency or the thought and a lot of this, of course, is, is this kind of Whig history, meaning like, oh, you know, I'll write a, a book. Like, I was a little girl in the South, and then the war happened. Now I realize I can be all I set my mind to. Well, there's a lot of that kind of like, you know, laid on too thick. But it was kind of like, oh, women realize in the South, we also can like do what the Northern women were doing before the war because of this. So changing the role of women, perhaps. Total change? Absolutely not. 
I know I lived in the South for five years. There's still so many women are so conservative in the South still by and large. You like the girls that were in my, my class at Mississippi state, a lot of them were like, were like self-identify as like real devout Baptist, very conservative political. I mean, now still like Mississippi state sorority girls would be like saying class, like I'm very, very conservative, you know, I'm proud of that, whatever. So I'm not saying the South overnight becomes this kind of like, you know, feminist um, utopia or something, but there's a lot of these changing things as well. There's also an idea of like internal division. Anyone see the movie Free State of Jones? Yeah. Matthew McConaughey plays in this. Um, I actually was privileged to give a talk with the author of this book because um, it was the, Matthew McConaughey made the movie off the book. She came to talk at, at Mississippi State. I got to speak alongside with her. And that's Victoria Bynum. I mentioned her before. These guys in the South basically are like, oh, everyone in the South is so South, right? No, we're going to be for interracial marriage and no slavery and the guy in fact um newton knight he marries a black woman and like you know so it's like it's this oh look things that you see is like being so progressive and at that time which white southerners were like that's so taboo blah blah all that's going on as well it's just complication of the war that often is broad brushed over in uh a one-size-fits-all everyone in the south was racist and hated the union everyone in the north loved lincoln and wanted to free the slaves like you just hear those kind of simple and that's not at all the case champ ferguson perhaps maybe the most notorious famous infamous tell me is he a freedom fighter or a terrorist right so it's a question today with geopolitics oh this guy yeah this guy he's leading these guys and filling the country blank he's a terrorist but the guy doing the exact same stuff he's a freedom fighter he supports the mcdonald's empire uh Champ Ferguson was this Confederate guerrilla warrior, claimed to have killed like over 100 Union soldiers, some even civilians, scandalously, I would say, in that sense. Just kind of like this mountain man sniper guy, whatever, just loose cannon, wannabe bond, whatever. Like this, there's all this stuff going on. South is not some monolithic, like everyone just loves everyone in this, you know, ideal of like the, the seceding states in 17th, this has everything, right? So much so in the Western part of Virginia, they secede northward to become West Virginia because they hate Virginia so much. So it's just like, I mean, yeah. Well, to show his extreme equality, not only did he marry a black woman, he also married a white woman. He was a polygamist, yeah? yeah. Oh, I, I didn't get that far. Very <laughs> <laughs> open minded, though. Uh, I'm going to pause the recording now. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Uh, also, like Henry Veers, commandant of Andersonville notorious Confederate prison, you have as well that idea of like concentration camps, North and South. He's executed for war crimes after the war. Does he deserve it? Uh, you know, like a lot of it was, okay, well, Union soldiers are in this prison camp and George is 190 degrees in the summer. It's like, is he like torturing them to death? I mean, I don't, a lot of that kind of stuff, but the Civil War has as well as kind of this concentration camp side and prisoner of war sets often not talked a lot about. All of that is going on in Southern society. Women, African-Americans, the prison camps, guerrilla warfare. It's not everyone behind Jefferson Davis, just like Lincoln has his own domestic opposition in the North. And at this point, as I've been going on for seven minutes, you're like, man, that guy can get focused when he wants to. He's focused right now. I'm focused. You're welcome, by the way. Um, <laughs> Northern society, Northern society uh, is a very, very similar story, okay? It's a very, very similar story. As men entered the Union Army, women's proportion of the manufacturing force went from one-fourth to one-third. At home, women organized over 1,000 soldiers, aid societies, rolled bandages for use, raised millions of dollars. The women that are already kind of like woke politically, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, pre-war Seneca Falls women, go full Rosie Riveter. That is not a World War II phenomenon. That's a civil war phenomenon, women getting involved in the workforce. Um, because, duh, right? There's no women soldiers at this time, so someone has to work in the factories. It can't all be like nine-year-old Irish kids. Like, it has to be, you know, there's... And that's a tragic, yeah, tragic reality, right? I mean, slavery by another name. Yeah. But uh, yeah, women are getting very, very involved. Uh, the Cincinnati Gazette insisted that sturdy, daughter, sturdy daughters of the farmers would lose no caste in a system of farm labor. I argue, this is a freaking awesome point because I made it. <laughs> um, <laughs> in the West, in the West, why is it, when, when do women get the right to vote in America? 1920. 1920, exactly, 19th Amendment. Women get the right to vote in Wyoming in 1890. And I've asked my classes, like at Washington State, U of I, anywhere, why is this the case? People always answer the same false, like wrong answers. 
God bless them. I have always been blessed with really good students. I mean that I'm, I, I would right now like rip them. Oh, like, you know, I mean that. I've always been blessed with very intelligent students. They always get this answer wrong. And they're like, oh, they just like, uh, they did it because they were more about democracy or they're more about freedom or they respected women more. I'm like, none of that is true. It's simply that women in the West were doing all the labor the men were doing. So the guys are like, okay, I don't have to wonder if a woman could ride a horse or shoot a gun. She does it every day. I guess they can vote. I mean, we're already equal. We're already building the farms together. Go ahead. There's also a ploy to get more women out there. Yeah, I remember, I remember you mentioned that earlier too. Totally. Yeah, if you have a city that's 80% men for appropriation, obviously, and for the next uh, demographic health, the next you know census record, the next generation, you need women out there, will entice you to look, it's the most kind of like pro-women area. But really, that's fine. That's true. But a lot of guys were like, Again, not to use modern anachronistic terms, it wasn't that everyone in the South and North, the guys were so sexist or chauvinist. It was just kind of like women have their domestic sphere and mm -hmm. that's what they do and they like it or whatever, or who cares? We're not even asked their opinion, I guess the, the chauvinist guys. Well, they, I assume they were able to vote in local and state elections. Yeah, it's not, not national. It's not national. It's not national. Yeah. No, I think that's a federal kind of mandate of the 19th right. Amendment. But yeah, but just kind of because, but because again, guys, and it wasn't those guys were so like, those guys were so, such feminist guys. They just literally did all this stuff together because they didn't, they would die. If the women didn't help mend the fences and herd the cattle, whatever, everyone would die. And so there was just this nice, like, I remember like my wife is a native Idahoan and she talked about how when we were in Mississippi, it was the first time in her life she ever, ever like encountered like sexism or something or like where the kind of the traditional Southern stereotype of like, oh, women should do this. But she said in the West to this day, and I can't speak for other Western women, but she said growing up, like that was not even a thing. It was like almost like this assumed equality of like in the West, the West has this nice kind of feature of like, now the West is freaking psycho conservative in some ways. It's not about, that's the get wrong too. People in my class will say like, oh, it's because they were conservative or liberal. Like the West is so conservative and traditionally minded. But like my wife would say, um, she said multiple times, like it seemed like in the West, women were more visible on like doing all the same things guys were doing on farms or whatever. And I think that's kind of true beginning with the Civil War again. Mm -hmm. Uh, what else? The North. Okay, so the North as well. Orphanages increase, sadly, God rest their souls. That's maybe a, a sad segue to next week, you know, with all the, the death and destruction. Um, you have the development, also Drew Gilpin Faust. Drew Gilpin Faust says the American civil religion, Arlington National Seminary, the idea of memorializing brave men that died for the struggle, that begins in the Civil War era too. Uh, some, say, sorry? You said it was on Lee's estate? I, in Arlington, yeah. It was on Lee's, exactly, at his family home in, in, in Arlington. Was established no, long before that. I think like, like Light Horse Lee, his like grandfather, father, I forget, he was just, I forget exactly. So Lee, it, became the after the Civil War. it did, after the Civil War, yes, 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 yes. Oh, but it was not established for that purpose. It was the family estate before that. Yeah. By the way, the, the, the property, 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 property. Did you probably leave them a really good job of putting in the industrial revolution and being involved in, you know, Yeah, that's true. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly. Another real quick point. Up there in the math department, they used to have a, a deal on the wall there talking about women in, uh, in different uh, scientific and mathematical stuff. Mm -hmm. And one of the particular ones that I was very interested in was Edith Clark. And she was one of the women that. They were doing a lot of the computations, but he and Clark uh, got into electrical engineering stuff to do the transmission lines and symmetrical components and a bunch of really neat stuff. Like that. Just one of the ones. She wrote a couple of books. On it. That's really cool. There's, there's a really neat thing they had up there. I don't know if it's still. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, that, that's that's a really great story. And uh, mm. a lot of this stuff's kind of hiding in plain sight. Like, thank you for bringing that up because a lot of people don't know about these kind of things. Like you said. Hmm? That movie, yeah, the astronaut, yeah. right? Astrid. Johnson or something was her name, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in the North, like the South, same similar kind of thing, like a lot of domestic disturbance. You have the draft rights in New York City as you have the Southern bread rights. We talked about that. And also African-American rules in the North a lot of anti-black racism in the North, which is manifested through the draft rights, blah, blah, blah. Again, don't paint with broad brushes, right? It's like, oh, like I'm, I'm a Pennsylvanian. Oh, the South is bad. The South were racist. The North wasn't. The North was just as racist as the South. 
Only in New England were Blacks allowed to vote without restriction. Only Massachusetts had desegregated schools. So it's, without, it's not surprising the 54th Massachusetts, this Black regiment, largely composed of free Blacks, um, including sons of the abolitionist Frederick Douglass, that they're like the most famous regiment. And a guy from that regiment, Sergeant William H. Carney, uh, for his bravery during one of these battles, never, he was a flag bearer, not allowing the flag to touch the ground as the first Black man awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. And so that as well too, like all of these things, right, will play into the Reconstruction era, these changing attitudes, society, um, can't think of a synonym for change, just kind of like being differentiated, whatever, that's probably incorrect. But just a lot of different stuff that once we get to Reconstruction, it'll be like, well, when we start talking about these principles, where do some of these, these things come out of the blue? No, a lot of these ideas are kind of banding about a lot. All right, uh, Earl. Uh, it's so good to see you back on the Zoom stream. Um, I hope that the problems resolve with logging on. Um, I hear you though. There's often like what like there's a glitch and somehow or something. I'm glad that we can you can join today as always. And thank you all for being here. Next week is um, a couple of things to say. Yeah, next week is Drew with Faust. There's a presentation tonight on theology of the body by this guy Brendan McCauley, somewhere on campus, uh, which would be really good. He does. I, I, don't, yeah, I think it's in the posters downstairs. Yeah, exactly. Somewhere on campus. Go find it. Go walk around. <laughs> it's small enough. You'll get there. But I know it's somewhere you can ask Heather downstairs. Brendan McCauley is, he worked at the uh, Theology of the Body Institute. So he's an expert on the thing in terms of, I'm not saying that, I mean, like, sincerely, like, you know, take, I'm an expert on the Civil War. I'm scare quote myself too, whatever that means. Like, I mean, that is a good thing. He's not just a guy who's intelligent and bright. He is all those things. He also, like, he, this is his kind of forte. It's somewhere on the U of I campus tonight. And he's just doing a presentation like the meaning of humanity or something. It's downstairs. Um, PLC mm, tender love and care 040. Yeah. TLC was a women's R&B group in the 80s or 90s. No, I don't want my scrub. A scrub can't get no love from me. <laughs> Hang on the passenger side of his best friend's ride trying to holler at me. No, I don't want no scrub. That was one of their famous songs. Um, <laughs> it's not, it's not named after Tia. It's not after the after R&D group. I think it's a different name. Next Wednesday, guys, I'm going to be shameless, gross. I, my video is up on Instagram, my promotional video. If you go to reels on Instagram, you can look at the, and I played a song on the piano. That's not complicated. Eric Meyer, who's a true genius, put like stars and stuff in there and text and did a great job. It's his, it's his directorial I don't know if debut, but he deserves an Oscar anyways. I know I deserve best actor. So whatever. He's <laughs> it's, a true genius. Are there false geniuses? Me. Yeah. Someone like me who <laughs> pretends to be smart, but he's not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you go on to, <laughs> if you go on to Instagram, the reels, you can see a promotional video for it. And I play the theme from Aladdin and say, if you like this stuff, you're in a cold, come see you talk about colds. I'm giving it my last hippo lecture next Wednesday normal time with beforehand, all the more important stuff, mass and adoration and all the kind of great things, including free dinner. And then the talk will be, I can't wait for this talk guys. I'll just tell you right now, again, I'm sorry for being so gross. I don't care at all. I love self-promotion. The talk starts off with this guy being dropped off in Antarctica. And Sophia, I'm looking at you because I know you're not gonna be there. So I wanna get, I wanna, I'm trying to make you feel bad. I wanna give you as much information as possible because you deserve that. This guy gets dropped off in Antarctica and he's in nothing but a bathing suit because he has this condition that he can survive cold temperatures. He walks across Antarctica, finds this book that a conspiracist told him existed there. And he proves it's true. No one had the guts to find it. He finds it and he will narrate to you this book called Catholicism, Cold, it's True and False Religions. In my talk, eventually at the end of the talk, it has different sections. At the end of the talk, a girl, beautiful woman, a fjord princess will arrive riding a polar bear, offering this guy penguin beer. And he will say to her, may I read out loud to you this nonfiction book? She's like, you may. Would you like to get married afterwards? And it's a love story as well into Antarctica. I'm, it's, I can't wait. It's going to be so Who's much his fun. Name, Lars? His name actually is Alabaster Alabama Pie Davis. He goes by Alabama Pie. <laughs> and I've, like this other guy. I've been practicing saying Alabama Pie without laughing because it's a serious name. It's not to be trifled with. Earl, I will see you later. <laughs> Tell Barbara we said hi. You guys are the coolest. And goodbye to all.